Hey guys, it's uh, Jonathan McCormack. I'm a attachment specialist over in New York. You can find me on attachmenthealinghelp.com. I want to talk about despair and attachment and the unlived life, the unloved life. Uh, there's a big question now. Why is everyone so fragile? Where's all this suicidal despair coming from? I would suggest it's from attachment. And uh, so I'll give you two boring reasons, but then a really deep one of what's going on. And, and I'll explain the relationship between despair and what's happening with these attachment styles. Um, the, the, the first explanation is how we're thinking. Um, so like a little kid actually needs a parent or else it'll die, it'll completely die. So if you're a little kid and you're eight years old and you feel the connection to your mother isn't all that it should be, your body, your mind will cause an emotion, perhaps panic. And this emotion is trying to get you to do something, reach out, make sure that connection's there. So you might cry. If you're neglected and you have more of like an avoidant style, you've reached out and you've got no response. So then your body shuts down, deactivates. If you're disorganized, perhaps you experience fear. You went to get regulated and your mother wasn't able to do that for you. But that was as a child. As an adult, you don't need anyone to survive. You need relationships, but no intimate relationships. I know people that survive, they have almost no friends. I mean, they're living. When you use the word need, and we do all the time, these are my developmental needs, the mind, the unconscious mind thinks survival. I need this to survive. But you don't. Uh, little children do. And, and this actually uh, is true. A little child had to know that it was uh, attached and had that connection secure. I was just reading about the uh, Roman Empire. And uh, ladies, it's true that that's what guys do. We sit around thinking about the Roman Empire all day. And the other parts of our mind are preoccupied if we can... I don't know, win fighting a bear or something. I, I think I could. And this lovely letter from this Roman soldier to his wife, and it's so tender. Dear uh, my beloved wife, I'm thinking about you every day. I love you. But at the end, the campaign didn't go so well. Uh, so I'm going to need you to take our youngest, not five summers old, the daughter, and uh, leave her in the woods. But anyway, I'm thinking about you, and I love you, and I'll be back. Whew, jeez killing their five-year-old daughter. I mean, that's a reality, though, especially before civilization. That could happen, you know? That could happen. And, and think about it. As adults, I've heard this people, that when they break up, they say, Whoa. feels like she abandoned me. He abandoned me. Abandoned? But wait a minute. An adult can't get abandoned. Little child can. The ravens come and take them off. No one's 50 years old and says, oh, my parish has died. I'm an orphan. I've been orphaned. No. That wounded child part is reacting. And if you think you need a relationship, it's not going to work out. Because you're going to put so much pressure on that, that you need this person to survive. That's what your unconscious will be thinking. So any, if you uh, have an anxious attachment, you're hypervigilant. And any sign that things aren't working out, you'll flip out, the, the, the body will cause you to uh, feel panic so you get that connection right away. That's not useful. So the best way to think about it and even speak about it is uh, relationships are not necessary. You don't need them. Relationships are valuable, very valuable. When they break up, it's sad. And, and you do grieve, you know. So, and we can fix that. We can use parts work and we can find that inner child, if you want to think about it that way, and listen to it, unburden it, witness it, and get the unconscious to realize you're no longer eight. You don't need this person, you know? The other uh, reason is just how we are. Uh, for thousands of years, you needed to know you were accepted in your tribe. And if you weren't, if you were ostracized, oof, that meant you're on the outskirts. And you really can't survive all by yourself. 
you'd be out, you'd be in the cave trying to, I don't know, eat berries or whatever. But you'd panic if you went out and you didn't see your tribe, you know? Think of, uh, so a lot of women have told me, Mean Girls was an experience in their high school. I guess that was a movie, I didn't see it. But this terrible experience where these uh, uh, teenagers, the, these women would kind of gang up in cliques and terrorize like one or two. And boy, you'd think, what's the big deal? It's high school. But I tell you, it makes a big effect. Why? Well, it wouldn't if you had your own tribe, if you were part of a family with a huge uncles, aunts, and all this. Yeah, that would be your tribe. And these women would be uh, gaslighting you. And who cares? Who cares? But you don't have a huge tribe. These, the people you see are your tribe. And believe it or not, with brain scans, when we walk out and we just see strangers, it's as if uh, your brains are telling you that your culture has been destroyed, uh, your tribe's been obliterated, uh, you're overrun with uh, strangers now. Yeah, you know? Uh, because that, that's, 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 that's how our brains, you know, you're programmed to see a bunch of people you know really familiarly. And, and, and think about it, like back in the day, if you weren't close to your dad, that's okay. You, know, you could be close to Uncle Jack. If not Uncle Jack, then Uncle Jebediah. And if not him, Grandpa Jeb or whoever. If not him, Auntie this, Auntie that. I mean, you had a huge, huge, there was no such thing as insecure attachment. Uh, primal people, if you look at them, they always have their infants. Uh, Gabor Mate goes on about this, on their backs. They always carry them wherever they go. And there's, there's no sense of you ever because you're being insecure. That just doesn't happen. Um, so th those are the social costs. And so, you know, I, I know the boomers and older people like, oh, this generation is so... Uh, so fragile. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, Mark Terrell was just saying, like, why come teenagers are committing suicide? And he says, there's human givens we all need. And he marks them. And he says, we need to feel safe and secure, be given attention, have emotional intimacy. We have to feel included in the wider community. We have to have a sense of privacy, a sense of status within social groupings, a sense of competence, and a sense of meaning and purpose. Well, I have to say, most teenagers I know do not feel like they have a meaning or purpose. They feel ostracized. And you can have a million dollars and be fine. But your brain's telling you, no, you're in trouble. You're on the edge. And the story you tell yourself will follow the state of your nervous system. Story always follows state, you know? So yeah, yeah, if you feel that way, you're, you're probably gonna be fragile, you know? Uh, uh, Johann Harry uh, started to investigate depression, you know? But, you know, he started saying, let me go to India, see how people deal with depression, then America, then England, then tribes. It's gotta be different. It wasn't, it wasn't. What he found, what he wrote the book, Lost Connections, Why You're Depressed and How to Find Hope, a great book. And he discovered, no, no, that there's a couple things that we all need. If we don't have it, we fall apart. The inner chaos will destroy us. So he, he discovered this. Statistically, we need to feel like we belong. How, how many of us feel that way? We need to feel valued. By whom? Who? Our jobs? What, what, you know, come on. We need to feel we're good at something. And we need to feel we have a secure future. Good luck with that. We live in the postmodern liquid modernity. Who knows what's gonna happen next year? Uh, so yeah, th th those are the seven social causes of disconnection. We need meaningful work, other people, meaningful values. We need status and respect. We need a hopeful uh, future. And, and those are the things we need. If we don't have them, at least three or four of those, you cannot do much, you know. I have a Russian friend from Siberia. He says, the only thing a man can do alone is die. Because he lived in a community where to be alone meant death. You needed people just to survive. I don't know if you guys know about NARM, the neuroaffective, the whole model, Lauren Keller's, it's great, it's very somatic. But, but he, you know, he has five core needs and their associated core capacities. And these are connection, 
the capacity to be in touch with our bodies and emotions and connection with others. But boy, we're pretty disassociated. I mean, we barely have in real life friends and, and we can't even feel the sensations. To attunement, you know, the capacity to attune to our needs and our emotions. A lot of us don't even know our needs. I, I, I've talked to people like, okay, you want to get in this relationship? What are your needs? Because maybe he can't fulfill them. Maybe he doesn't know. What are they? And they're like, I don't know. I don't to be loved. I don't know. You don't even know their needs. You know, trust. You know, capacity to recognize, to reach out, to take physical and emotional nourishment. Autonomy. You know, you need some kind of freedom to set appropriate boundaries, set limits, and of course, love and sexuality. Eros, the capacity to live with an open heart, to integrate a loving relationship with sexuality. Yeah. And I, I hear a lot of uh, older people look at the young generation, and then you'll be very depressed, and they'll say, why? What's wrong with your life? What's wrong with your life? You're not fighting in the Ukraine, right? I, that is, they have a point. Yeah, that's true. What they mean is what are the circumstances of your life? But the real question is, what is your life? Life is existential, something you feel. Is your life vital? Do you feel dead? Do you feel diminished? You know? They don't realize it has less to do with circumstances and more with having these human givens. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, I remember uh, reading uh, uh, in India, they had all these earthquakes. And so America sent all these trauma experts down there to help them. And they found out none of these Indian people had trauma. But the head trauma guy goes down there. Earthquake hits. He's in the building. People died. He gets out. And he looks on the grassy field. And there are families there. Hugging, crying. He's all alone. And he is shaking. He gets post-traumatic stress. He didn't have the human givens. He didn't have much in his life. Yeah, he goes into it. You know, he's very lonely. He didn't have much. This is so, so biologically driven, believe it or not. They, they, the guy wrote Chasing the Scream. He actually, he was a doctor. He went to India to take care of all these people. Horrified by what he found in gymnasiums filled with patients. But the patients had their families with them. They had like four people living under their bed. They, they had things on the top. It would have family members sleeping on top. Horrified. Horrified. And then after a few days, he realized he was using barely half the pain medication he usually does. Half. Yeah, love is a painkiller. These people didn't need that much. That's how serious it is. And in fact, you know, his, his hypothesis is that addictions are an attachment issue. Because he looked at all these people. Some people are on morphine in the hospital for like six months. They don't even have, uh, you know, withdrawals. You know, they don't feel anything. Why? And he looked at them. The people who do and the people who get addicted don't have attachment, you know? If you don't have these things, you can't attach to a human. Well, I mean, there's, there's always heroin. I mean, there's the bottle. You can attach to the bottle. It's not as good, but keep you alive, you know? Um, and, and, and one other thing, though. I will say, I, yeah, I was reading the story about these 17 women. Um, in Africa, they worked for the UN, got captured for two years, raped two years every day. Whew. And they came back. Interesting, five of them ended up wrecks. And why? If, you, if I asked you, you'd probably say, well, they got raped. I mean, Jesus Christ, what, what do you think? But the rest were fine. They went through the same thing, so it wasn't that. And they asked these women, how does it feel to be a rape victim? And they actually said, that happened. That's not who I am. Who am I? Well, I'm a mother. Ask me that. 
I'm a lover, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend. Some of these women actually went back to the UN job. Oof, God bless them. So they had purpose. They had a place in society. What about the other five? They had nobody. Yeah, yeah, they had nobody. So yeah, they went through this experience where it's like, you know, you know what you are. You're a piece of meat, poisoned meat to someone I can rape for however much I'd like. And some of them came back and the world opened up like a mother and gave them a space, gave them a place, gave them an identity. Some of them, the other five, no, no man wanted them. Uh, they couldn't make friends and they didn't have all those things. So it's not just what's happening. It's also the circumstances, you know? So you can see a guy who has a job or a girl and they look fine and they're going to work and wh why are they so unhappy? Why are they so unhappy? Because they have nobody and the pain is much higher. Even physical pain is much higher. That's how serious it is. Um, and so boomers will say that, like, what's wrong with your life? So this is interesting though. I actually believe this, that, that, you know, humans are relational, but someone actually, a friend said, being, to be, to be, to exist, is to be in communion. You only exist as far as you're in communion. Have you ever felt that way when you're not in communion, that you almost like exist less? like you're faded, skeletal. Um, and, and yet, when you're connected, you almost feel like you're, you exist more, you're, you're more dense, more ontologically real. I, I, to me, that makes sense. It, it almost reminds me of the, uh, uh, the Velveteen Rabbit, you know, that, that old uh, children's, but it's actually pretty profound. They had that thing, uh, you know, with the bunny, it's a stuffed bunny, and it's just a stuffed bunny, and at the end, it becomes like a real bunny. So it goes from faith. How? From love. But the love, it so it says, uh, you become. This is from the book. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or who have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you're real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. And uh, I, I think that's fairly profound for a children's book. Uh, the sharp edges really got me. It reminded me of Schopenhauer, the philosopher. He has this famous metaphor of the porcupines. It goes, a troop of porcupines is milling about on a cold winter's day. In order to keep from freezing, the animals move closer together. Just as they are close enough to huddle, however, they start to poke each other with their quills. In order to stop the pain, they spread out, lose the advantage of commingling and again begin to shiver. This sends them back in search of the other, and the cycle repeats, as they struggle to find a comfortable distance between entanglement and freezing. Wow, that sounds like an attachment disorder. You know, porcupines trying to come together, but they can't because they either become enmeshed, you know, anxious attachment, or they can't come together at all, avoidant attachment, you know. And, and the existential pain from that is uh, great indeed. And it, 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 a lot of this, though, you know, I'm talking about avoidant, but, but it's almost, uh, it depends. It's not a spectrum. Disorganized. Uh, even, even towards, like, schizoid, it can get to, like, that alienated. And that's more or less caused by uh, unsatisfied attachment needs. Usually it's the mother because that's the primary caregiver. Is perhaps a hostile figure you know for whatever reason the child learns to be hyper vigilant and in survival mode 
and can't relax. You've seen little kids on the playground, right? They get dysregulated and they run back and they touch mom. They touch mom. Whew. And they get regulated and they go back and play. We're the exact same. We get dysregulated. We come home, hopefully to somebody who we can emotionally regulate with each other, you know. But these kids can't. And since they can't get regulated by the mother, they cannot relax. And eventually it inhibits their attachment impulses and deactivates the attachment system simply as self-protection, you know. And, and, and it, first is the initial stage of threat, hyperactivation. And then when it doesn't get regulated by the mother, they have to do something, so it just shuts off, you know. And that aspect, it's almost, you know, Freud actually said this, that like, boy, people, people who are well-loved by their mother, it sounds like the world opens up to them. It's almost mystical. I mean, it's magical, you know. And there's kind of that sense. It's very odd. Um, I remember uh, Virgil, you know, George Open's translation. He has this line, Begin, O small boy, to be born on whom his parents have not smiled. No God thinks worthy of his table, no goddess of her bed. I mean, if you haven't been loved by your parents or experienced emotional neglect, yeah, that's how it feels. I'm not worthy of a woman's bed. and The gods aren't gonna smile on me, you know? That's just your attitude towards the world. Your attitude towards the world is a lot like your attitude towards your mother. And, and the world reacts back to that. Uh, indeed, you know, Will Durant, this story, and it reminds me of what he said about uh, Brian and uh, Goethe. He said, these men were almost by circumstances doomed to pessimism. A man who has not known a mother's love, or worse, has known a mother's hatred, has no cause to be infatuated with the world. Yeah, it's hard to fall in love with the world. It's hard. Yeah, I actually believe uh, Philip Larkin had a poem. I, I, th I I honestly believe this is the greatest poem about love written in the 20th century. A lot of people disagree with me about that. Uh, these people are wrong, and you shouldn't listen to them. So the poem is Faith Healing, but listen. <clears throat> Philip Larkin. Slowly the woman file to where he stands, upright in rimless glasses, silver hair, dark suit, white collar, Stewards tirelessly persuade them onward to his voice and hands, within whose warm spring rain a loving care each dwells some twenty seconds. Now, dear child, what's wrong? The deep American voice demands, and scarcely pausing, goes into a prayer, directing God about this eye, that knee. Their heads are clasped abruptly, then exiled like losing thoughts. They go in silence. Some sheepishly stray, not back to their lives just yet. But some stay stiff, twitching and loud, with deep hoarse tears, as if a kind of dumb and idiot child within them still survives to reawaken at kindness. Thinking of the voice at last calls them alone that hand have come to lift and lighten and such joy arrives their thick tongues blort their eyes squeeze grief a crowd of huge unheard answers jam and rejoice what's wrong mustached and flowered frocks they shake by now all's wrong and everyone there sleeps a sense of life lived according to love to some, it means the difference they could make by loving others. But across most, it sweeps as all they might have done had they been loved. That nothing cures. An immense slackening ache. As when thawing, the rigid landscape weeps, spread slowly through them. That and the voice above saying, Dear child, and all time has disproved. What I like about this is uh, the life according to love, being loved, you know, that unlived life. And I hear this a lot. I have here for wives that are going through so many stresses, but they think, 
if I could be loved, if I could just get what I need, I would be such a good mother. I wouldn't flip out. I wouldn't be stressed. I'd be a good wife. I'd be a good daughter. I'd be a good worker. And men, you know, if I had the love of a good woman, you know what I could do? I can do this. I can do that. On and on and on. All those things. Oh, if only I was loved. And it's that sense of this unlived life. If they be loved, to be more real. Their life would be more real. And if you can imagine yourself, you know, I know spiritual people, religious people, they, they believe like they're fully loved by God or whomever. If they really believe that, that'd be amazing. I mean, because there's nothing that could really happen. You could just go out in the world feeling safe, feeling like the world itself was a mother waiting to embrace you. Uh, that's not how it feels for a lot of people. And so that's the link between attachment and despair. What people don't understand is when people commit suicide, it's to get away from death. It's a living death. And usually the impulse to commit suicide is coherent and rational. People have told me, I say, what's your life like? And they tell me, and, and everyone tells them, you have a lot to live for, you have a lot to live. They tell me, and it doesn't sound like it. It doesn't sound like you have much to live for at all. Yeah, sounds like that's a perfectly rational, you know, decision. Uh, it makes sense to me. It sounds like a very wounded, painful life. David Foster Wallace, you know, the guy who wrote Infinite Jest, and he, he eventually hanged himself. One of the most brilliant minds. I actually have a buddy who knew him, good friends with him. And I asked him, like, oh, what was David like? He said, David was obsessed with happiness. That's all he talked about. And also he was the most miserable person he ever met. That's the way it is. But he wrote, he wrote an essay on suicide and he said, you know, a suicide is almost like someone jumping out a window, like you see in 9-11. All you see is the person jumping out the window. What you don't realize is the room is on fire. They're actually trying to get away from something. They actually want life. They want to feel alive. They want to be in communion with something. And if you're not, even if you have these things you're gonna get knocked down easily if you don't, you know, purpose, uh, a friend, a partner, uh, a job. If you don't have these things, yeah, little things, even biologically, will be a lot more painful. And so you may seem like, uh, I don't know, a tremendous weakness, but anyone would react the same way. We're meant to be strong in groups, and that's the only way we're strong. But uh, so that's my little explanation. I appreciate you guys hanging out and uh, listening to me ramble. If you want more, you can check out attachmenthealinghelp.com. I'm Jonathan McCormack. Thank you.